I will be talking about behavior-driven pragmatism. Oh, come the heck on. There we go. Sorry, my Mac is a little finicky sometimes. So, um, as I was introduced, my name is Pandy Knight. I am the lead software engineer and test at a company called Precision Lender, located in Cary, North Carolina. That's the Research Triangle region. Uh, I'm also the automation panda. I love all things about testing, automation, software, and for tonight, I'm going to talk about behavior-driven development. So you can follow me on Twitter at Automation Panda. You can check out my blog at automationpanda.com. Um, this, this is a picture of me since I'm not on video. This was taken at PyCon 2018. Fun times. Sure miss them. So let's talk about BDD. If anybody knows what BDD stands for, I'm going to flip it on its head for you because we're going to talk for a moment about buzzword driven development. Personally, I do not like buzzword driven development. The idea of a buzzword is something that catches a lot of attention but quickly loses its meaning because when it gets to upper echelons of those in power, all of a sudden it's twisted to mean something it probably wasn't originally. We all know software buzzwords, automation, shift left, agile, test driven, parallel, continuous, artificial intelligence, Python, Cucumber, Pandas. It's, it's all like overwhelming. I'm sure we've all heard these buzzwords before. It can really drive you to distraction because at the heart of all these things, there is some value, but they can get lost when we abuse these terms. Just make the DevOps happen for crying out loud. So let's stop for a moment. Buzzwords don't actually solve problems. Pragmatic people do. So anytime somebody's using a buzzword to draw attention to something or to teach us a new idea, try not to get caught up in any sort of hype, any sort of mania, and try to understand what is at the core of this idea or movement or new process or new thing that we're trying to learn here. Because when we hear something like behavior-driven development, what I have found is that it is kind of buzzwordy and people have a love-hate relationship with it. So what I wanna do, instead of just coming out and flashing BDD and telling you about what it is and what the processes are, I wanna turn it on its head and instead, let's look at three software development problems together that are very common that I've seen in almost every single team I've ever worked with. And then let's see how we can apply pragmatic solutions to those problems. Tonight's talk is going to be fairly, fairly high level. We're not going to be digging into code. We're not going to be teaching you how to write good gherkin, though those are certainly conversations we could have at another time. What I want to do is I want to focus on what are major problems that are very commonplace and what are some behavior-driven practices that we can use to solve these problems. First problem, miscommunication. Has everyone seen this chart before? This is the infamous Project Cartoon. You can even go to projectcartoon.com and get your own copies of it. It's very, very famous, well known. If you haven't seen it before, gorge your eyes out. If you have, chuckle to yourself because I can't hear you because you're on mute. Uh, the Project Cartoon is this, this cartoon or this diagram that shows how different types of people in different roles interpret a project's needs differently. Oops. Oops. So if we look at say um, on, on the top left here, how the customer explained it, they obviously didn't explain the swing they wanted very well because it's got three tiers. How the project leader understood it, wow, totally useless. Um, how the business consultant described it a little more to the right, it's like this big easy chair. Nothing's documented, support's crazy, customers build like a roller coaster. And we can, we can all chuckle about these things. Ha ha, it's funny because it's true. Um, but if you look at like what the customer really needed, they really just wanted to have a good time. They wanted a functional swing with a little bit of uniqueness. That's that tire swing um, on the bottom second from the right. But so oftentimes in our software projects, we, we end up in this very similar situation where there, there is this idea of the nominal thing that people want or need, but nobody really has a 
clear view in and of themselves, isolated in their roles, as to what that thing should be. Right? They don't need a three-tier swing. They don't need a rope with nothing on it. They need a tire swing. So what do we need to do to bring all these different people together in order to figure out what that tire swing actually is? Right? Because none of these perspectives are inherently wrong, but instead they are simply limited. And so we need to have some sort of better collaboration to overcome these miscommunications in order to develop the best product that not only meets needs and meets requirements, but delivers genuine true value. If we are to be reductionist, the three primary roles on any kind of software development team are going to be the biz role, the dev role, and the test role. Biz role, that's gonna be like your product owner or your business analyst, whatever fancy funny name you've got for it. The developer role is the person who's gonna make that code and the tester role is gonna make sure that code works. Historically, and even today in a lot of bigger organizations or um, more old school kind of organizations, these roles are very much siloed, right? I've even seen it where you have like a division or a department of product owners and then like a whole another team of developers and then a whole separate team of testers. And instead of practicing anything in an agile sense, whether it's capital A or lower A or post agile even, you really just have this mini waterfall, <laughs> right? We don't like these silos because when, when you, it, it's good to have these roles as, um, uh, cent as centers of excellence, right? It's good to have roles that you have an expertise that they, they each know their concern very, very well. But it's not good to create these artificial boundaries between these roles that inhibits collaboration. So in behavior-driven development, we have this, this concept of what we call the three amigos. The three amigos are those roles, the biz dev test. That's the name we call them. And we realize that the three amigos aren't silos and they aren't these, these abstracted kind of concerns to a development process in the form of people. They are people, right? The business owner, the developer, and the tester, and however many, iter however many of these we have, they're all people. And so they're going to interact, they're going to talk, they're going to have ideas, they're going to be passionate, they're going to agree, and they're going to disagree. So it's important that we get all of these three amigos talking together at regular intervals throughout our development process. So everyone's on the same page. We don't want to have these artificial silos or the artificial barriers, whether they're organizational or cubicle or just mental. Right? We want to bring these three amigos together. It's important that we recognize the value that each role brings. But it's also important that we recognize that no role in and of itself is able to accomplish all the things alone. So when we recognize that we have these three amigos and we assert the value that each brings to the table, then what we need to do for healthy development is we need to make sure that we schedule time together for these three amigos. And we want to be intentional with the time, right? Some people say three amigos is a philosophy where we simply intellectually assent to the fact that these roles exist and we speak words to promise that we will quote unquote collaborate. And we all know that's bull crap, that doesn't happen. What you need is action, right? You need to set meetings on your calendar whether that's something that's regularly scheduled as one of your agile ceremonies, whether that's, you know, you, you gather up the people from the cubicles at 10 o'clock for stand up, and then you, you dedicate a little bit of extra time in the coffee room to talk about all these other things that are going on. Or maybe instead of coffee room, now you have a virtual coffee room where everybody's on Zoom or whatever software you use. The key thing is, like I said, you should be intentional, right? Because without that intentionality, it, it is the inertia of, a person's role to stay within their role, to stay within their comfort zone. And if we're not intentional to go out of our way to seek other perspectives and to collaborate with others, then it can be very easy, especially in these stay at home lockdown coronavirus times, to, to stay to ourselves and, and not interact and not collaborate. So let's say we, we either schedule meetings or we schedule time, we set up Zoom calls where we're specifically going to put the three amigos in a room together. 
And that should also, it doesn't need to be exactly three people. You can have multiple people of each um, role in, in these three amigos meetings. So when you get these people together, what, what are things that they should do, right? So some, some ideas for this, uh, maybe this is a time where every week you set aside to just ask questions. It's, it's very common that the business owners are on the forefront of ideas, requirements, talking to customers, knowing where the product needs to go. And developers and testers may not always have that keen insight. So maybe this is a, a time for developers to ask questions to say, hey, you know, how is this thing supposed to be built? Or maybe it's a time for testers to say, hey, you know, I was trying to automate this test uh, based on the requirements here. And I was a little confused about how this particular aspect of the behavior is supposed to work. Can we talk about that? Other things the three amigos can do is they can set aside time to brainstorm ideas, right? It, it's not that the product owner has to be the originator of all the things, right? Maybe developers and testers have good ideas for where a product can go and what useful behaviors might be. So to set aside time to say, hey, let's take half an hour and just think big. Cool, that's pretty awesome. Uh, this can be a time to discuss current and upcoming features. Um, it could be the planning meeting itself. It could be a corollary to the planning meeting where maybe we sized and planned everything, but um, you know, mid sprint, maybe there's some jitter and there may be some interruptions and maybe we have to pivot a little bit. Or maybe a developer or a tester is done a little bit early or their project that would be done a little bit early and they wanna learn what's, what's next down the pike so they can prepare for it. Uh, three Amigos meetings could be a time to groom, or I think the new fancy Agile word is refine stories, right? Uh, we, we shouldn't necessarily be doing all of the um, writing of user stories and descriptions in the planning meeting. And if you do, I'm really sorry, because that really sucks. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> We're supposed to have these planning and grooming meetings that come, you know, at other times during the, the development process. And maybe that could be the time where we say, hey, we're gonna make sure that we include the developer and the tester with the business owner in these refinement meetings as we go over stories to make sure everything is good to go and make sure everybody is aware of what's coming. Uh, we, can do example, we can do an activity called example mapping, which we'll talk about a little bit later. We can also define behavior scenarios using Gherkin. Maybe this is a, a mob programming collaboration time where we can do some mob specification by example. And we'll talk a little bit more about Gherkin later as well. So there's tons of things that we can do together as Three Amigos. Oops. So like I said, with Three Amigos, recognize the roles and plan time intentionally. So let's talk about another problem that is very, very common within software development, and that is poor planning. Oh yes, because we're all experts at being able to perfectly guess and estimate what work we're going to be doing for the next two, four, six weeks, right? Wrong. So building on what we were just saying, you know, we got the three amigos together. We recognize their importance. We're going to be intentional with time. We have some ideas for activities, but they're still kind of loose and amorphous. Um, now what? What do, we, what do we do now that we have the three amigos together and we, we know we should be doing something? What we don't wanna have happen is this. We don't want a soul crushing conference meeting. We don't want the, the stand up meeting that turns into a status meeting where everybody just talks about everything in the world that they did on the past day for five minutes each and you're stuck there standing for 57 minutes on the clock you don't want it to be some really, really long, boring planning meeting on a Tuesday that starts at nine and is supposed to finish by lunch, but you know planning meetings always take seven and a half hours, so you know you're stuck in there all day. You don't want it where people, you have the, the scrum master in this planning meeting pulling teeth out of every developer one at, the, one at a time. What's the user story for this, or what's the user story for this ticket? What's the acceptance criteria? What is, what are all the dependencies on this? Let's do planning poker. Andy, everyone gave three points to this story, but you gave five. Why did you give five? Because I, because y'all didn't include testing in the sizing. Oh, but everybody agreed. Can you be okay with that? Fine, I'll shut up and be okay with it because I just want to get out of this soul crushing meeting, right? 
you leave the three amigos to their own devices, bad things can happen, right? It can be horrible, it can be boring. What we want instead is healthy structure. We don't want time-wasting structure. We don't want inefficient structure. We want some sort of activity that is going to help facilitate better collaboration. And when I say better collaboration, I'm specifically referring to better collaboration than either nobody comes in with an agenda or better collaboration than the, the typical state of agile scrum meetings, which really feel like pulling teeth and are horribly inefficient. The activity that can really help is a behavior driven activity called example mapping. And I mentioned this before, and we'll go through it together. Example mapping is a low tech, easy, fast way to keep conversations on track when we're talking about behaviors and features, things that we want to develop. It can prevent us from becoming unfocused, from becoming off topic, or from meetings becoming boring, right? Because example mapping is going to bring the entire team together to collaborate rather than suggest that the entire team collaborates but really have it only come down to only one or two people talking at a time, which is what I found typically with Agile Scrum. Side note, I'm very opinionated on these things. You may disagree with me, that's okay. That's why we have a question and answer session after this. So back on point, let's talk about example mapping and how it can help keep us on track. Example mapping is, a, is an activity, like I said, and it's one where we ought to have the three amigos and really, we ought to have, you know, at least a good representative subset of the team. All you need to do example mapping would either be a marker and a set of colored cards or something like a whiteboard, whether that's a physical whiteboard or you open up Google Docs <laughs> and share it on your conferencing software. With example mapping, you focus on one user story. You pick a user story to be the topic of discussion for that round of example mapping. And you're gonna write that user story on a yellow card. And you're gonna put that card at the top of your board. So here, um, we have an example user story. As a shopper, I want to put items to buy in a cart so that I can hold them while shopping. The user story should be fairly intuitive. I like to phrase my user stories in the as a blank, I want to blank, so that blank format. And I encourage you to use this format or a similar one, because what it does, it identifies a persona, it identifies a desired behavior, and it provides a business justification for that behavior. I will tell you that in example mapping sessions that my team and I have done, we have stopped the example mapping upon writing the user story in times when we got to the so that blank clause and we couldn't come up with the business justification. It almost felt like an identity crisis or something. Oh, I thought we needed this feature, but we don't understand enough about how it works or what the customer actually needs in order to justify its value. So we immediately stopped the example mapping. We put that ticket back on the backlog and we moved on to another one to refine. And then it was a spike to go find out exactly what the business value was in order to justify that work item. And we saved one of our developers about a two weeks worth of time from making something pointless and having it rejected or even worse, spending the time thinking it was valuable and actually having it be valueless. So definitely don't overlook writing your stories out well. So once you formulated your user story and you've written that on your yellow card and that is the thing at the top of the board for discussion, next what you do on your team is you proceed to writing rules. A rule is basically a condition that must be satisfied for the story. So we write each rule card on a blue, or sorry, we write each rule on a blue card and we place it underneath the story card. So for my shopping cart story, some of the rules to satisfy could be that one, items can be added to the cart, two, items can be removed from the cart, and three, maybe I have an upper limit of 20 items max in my cart that it can hold. 
Rules will ultimately become our acceptance criteria for the story. I like to think of them in terms of rules rather than calling them acceptance criteria here because it frames us in the mindset of what, what must be satisfied, what rule must be satisfied in order to accept this story. So take some time as a team to, to think about what these rules should be. And make sure you do write these cards as you go because a failed example mapping session is one where everybody talks and feels good about it, but then nobody actually writes anything down. So there's no artifacts later. So get your rules card down underneath your story. Third, we're going to write some example cards. The rules themselves can be rather abstract, right? They, they present these conditions that must be satisfied. And sometimes what can happen is everybody can agree on a rule and they can agree upon the language in which the rule is stated, but they may actually have different perspectives on what that rule means. So it is very prudent to provide concrete examples for every rule that will help flush out any sort of misunderstandings there could be. So we will write examples for each rule in, on green cards and put them underneath the rule cards so we know where they fall. So for example, with my items can be added to the cart rule card. Some of my concrete example cards could be, let's add one item to an empty cart, or let's add multiple items to a cart that already has multiple items. These concrete examples really make things easy to understand. It puts them in plain language. Um, they, this is not code or anything. Um, you don't have to be the developer to understand this. We're using plain language here because that way all three amigos can contribute and can understand. Concrete examples confirm that everyone is thinking about the behavior in the same way. And that's powerful, right? Because those miscommunications lead to inefficiencies in our process. So finally, uh, there may be times during example mapping when people raise up questions. Hey, what about duplicate items in our cart? Have we ever thought of that? Or who knows, there could be any other questions. Some of those questions can be discussed and answered immediately. Oh yeah, we know about this. I think we should handle it like this, that, whatever, discussion continues. But there are times when the questions cannot be answered immediately. Or there could be times when a question can derail the conversation. It could go way out into left field. It could be completely unrelated. It could give people an opportunity to either hijack the meeting or to get completely tangent or push their own agenda. I don't know, people are weird. But all that to say, whether good intentions are bad, uh, we want to make sure that we protect the integrity of the example mapping process. And so anytime that we cannot, exam or that we cannot answer a question immediately, what we want to do is we want to record it on a question card. Question cards are typically red to kind of denote, hey, we need to answer this. This is a blocker for potentially for the future. And it's important that we actually do record them because what we're saying by recording a question card is two things. First of all, yes, this question is valid and important and should not be ignored. Right? It is good to ask questions. It is healthy to ask questions, even if it's big ideas that we can't answer right now or we just don't have enough information. And we should record them and try to get them answers in the future. But at the same time, by writing on a question card, what we're saying is, yes, this is an important question, but because we can't handle it right now, we need to address it later. So we're going to put it on a card save it for later, continue with what we do know so we can actually make like real progress, tangible progress. And then after the example mapping, we can come back to those questions later. So it's, it's a very, very helpful technique to keep your example mapping sessions focused. So these, this entire activity should take about 20 to 30 minutes per story. And at the end of example mapping, Every team member should understand the story. There should be this, this mutual understanding of this is the way the behavior should work. This is what we're trying to make. This is the value we're trying to deliver. And here's all the things that need to be part of it. 
What we also get out of example mapping are these artifacts of the cards, right? The cards are not some things that we should just throw away. These are artifacts of our process and they can keep us accountable to developing the things that we said we would develop. And so the user story is pretty obvious. That one is our story that we work on. We have the rules that then become the acceptance criteria for the story. We know that the story should not be accepted as done unless the acceptance criteria is satisfied, which means that the rules are satisfied. All those example cards that we made, that's the natural starting point for your behavior specifications. And then from there, your actual test cases. So we don't need to have this moment where the, the testing roles have to go off into a cave for half the sprint trying to come up with a testing plan for these tickets, right? We've already specified, no, this is how the thing should work. These are the examples and the ways it, in which it does work. That in and of itself is a test case. <laughs> You've optimized your process right there. And finally, your questions. They should either become spikes to go investigate something, or they should become new Three Amigos meetings where you bring Three Amigos back together and you try to answer whatever those questions might be. All in all, what we want to do with this example mapping activity is we want to stop guessing and start planning. Right? In the traditional Agile Scrum process, in our planning meetings, we, we jot down what the user story is, we jot down what the acceptance criteria are, and then we play this round of planning poker where we kind of guess the size of this ticket. And historically, teams are almost always wrong. And we, we fudge it and say, we know points are just made up and we just kind of, we're not supposed to size it by time, but we size it by time anyway. And we, we just kind of average out over time. If we get something wrong, it's okay. But almost every time that I've been part of the Scrum team, at the end of your sprint, you have review and retro. You always miss your targets, always. <laughs> and it's, then you, you self-flagellate to say, oh, I can't believe that we missed our goals that were totally made up to begin with. Oh, so horrible. We'll do better next time. We don't do better next time. Or we just tweak a process somehow that has some other sort of unintended consequence. And so in, in that, we're just guessing at how much we can get done. But with example mapping, we don't need to be guessing. Look at the number of cards you have. Look at the number of rules you have to satisfy. Look at the number of examples you have. They represent the genuine size and complexity of the user story. So you no longer have to guess at the size of it. The process basically shows you what the size is. And so we don't have to then, you know, guess how long it's going to take. We don't have to guess the, the steps that we need to do. We don't need to go back in the middle of the sprint and say, I'm not sure I understood this correctly. I think I developed the wrong thing. It's all right there. We have the artifacts, we have the documentation, we have the accountability. So with example mapping, we can not only become more efficient with our three amigos meetings, but we can stop guessing and start truly planning. So now let's talk about our third problem, deadlines. In my humble experience, there is a 99% chance that your team won't get everything done in an iteration. Whether you call them sprints, iterations, marathons, epics, who knows what. Most likely, you're not going to get all the things done. Even if you plan it out, quote unquote, perfectly, even if you're always on target with your velocity, there's always going to be some things that don't get done. Why? That's just the way things go. There's always more to accomplish. Sometimes it can be a little bit, sometimes it can be a lot. So why don't we get stuff done? Well, when we do agile or whatever type of iterative process, or heck, maybe even you're doing waterfall and you're not getting stuff done either. That's totally cool too. Whatever your process is and whatever your cycle size is, there is a lot, and I mean a lot, that goes into developing high quality software. First of all, you gotta figure out the stuff. You gotta gather requirements, figure out what is the business value being served here? What do the customers want? What do the customers really need? If, even if that's not what they say they want. So you gotta figure out the stuff. Then what you gotta do is you gotta plan the stuff. Okay, so we know there's gotta be priorities. 
and we got to size all these things. We got to line them up like dominoes and knock them over one after the other. And we can't do it all in one day. It's going to take a very, very long time. So you got to do all this planning. And then you got to plan the individual stories themselves. Hopefully you do it with examples. Then you got to build the stuff, right? Developers got to be there cranking out code because otherwise there ain't no software going to be had. And then after they build the stuff, they got to test the stuff because just because one guy or girl built something doesn't mean it actually works. So you got to test it, make sure it's good. And then after that, you got to refactor the stuff because maybe it wasn't built the way it was supposed to be. Or maybe there's a new feature that has to add on to an old feature that the old feature needs to be tweaked a little bit. Then after all the build, test, and refactor, you got to fix the stuff because it's not a matter of if, but when bugs happen, you got to fix the stuff. And then you repeat this whole loop over again. Then because you like the benefits of continuous testing and having fast feedback, you got to automate the tests for the stuff. It's not just good enough to manually test it. You got to automate these tests. You got to have that safety net, right? Instant feedback, boom. Before it goes out the door, you got to document the stuff so people know how to use it. You got to demo the stuff, right? Not only to your product owner, but probably to your customers. And then the last thing you got to do to all this is you got to ship the stuff. Deployment is no joke. So in the waterfall model, this could take weeks, months, years, lifetimes, who knows. In Agile, we say that we're Agile because we can iterate very quickly and we might have this on a two week sprint or maybe a three week sprint or maybe we're just doing mini waterfall and we won't admit it and we're doing it on a four week sprint. This has happened. So the, the more that we, we try to shrink our iterations, the more we try to shrink our cycles, the less time there is to do all the stuff. Um, and so we typically, if we're doing the way, if we just do this in a you know, sequential fashion or in a mini waterfall fashion, or maybe just in a straight up waterfall fashion or whatever, whether we're lying to ourselves or not, there's still a lot of stuff to do. And if we can't get it done, and we still have these deadlines that we have set on ourselves, whether they are real deadlines or arbitrary deadlines, we still have to somehow get to number 10 <laughs> within the time that we have. So what do we do? We have so much stuff. Maybe we can do some of it next sprint. What gets cut? Well, a lot of we know we can't not build the stuff and we can't not ship the stuff. So it's usually the stuff in between that we cut. Things like testing and refactoring. Maybe we ship with bugs that we know about. Uh, maybe we don't even bother to automate tests at all. Just, no, nope, there's not enough time for that. Not important. We gotta, we gotta go now, we gotta go now. We gotta get this stuff out the door, we gotta go, right? Rush, 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 run, run, run. We always like to lie to ourselves and maybe we can do it next sprint. Or maybe we'll do testing and automation sprint plus one. And I'm like, no, you know you're not gonna do that because what's gonna happen in the next sprint? You're gonna start back here. Oh, I got so much stuff to do. Let me cut more stuff. <laughs> you have this never ending cycle of cutting very important stuff, right? And, and we think that we're, we're cutting less important stuff and this may, this may work okay for a sprint or two or three, but ultimately we're building up a, a, a massive grave of technical debt that will kill us. Right? Because if we, don't, if we don't do enough testing on the stuff, our quality is going to suffer. Right? Our customers are going to find problems instead of us internally, and we're going to lose face, and we're going to lose money, and we're going to lose our customers, and we're going to lose our company, and then we're going to lose our jobs. And then that's just, we don't want to go there. That's bad. Or like if you don't take the time to automate your tests, you're going to be constantly bailing. It's going to be like bailing water out of a boat that has a hole in the bottom right? You can't, you can't just manually test all the things. And so you're going to really have weak test coverage overall, instead of, you know, paying it as you go and automating as you go. So we know that short iterations are good. We know that delivering value quickly is good. We know that iterating and pivoting quickly is good, but we still know that there's too much stuff to do. What we should be asking ourselves is, is there a way to optimize this process, right? Can we do all the things, get all the stuff done while not cutting any of it or not pushing it to another sprint? Is that possible? And to do that, can we 
optimize our process. We always look at efficiencies in code and performance metrics, but rarely in software development do we look at optimizing our process. And I think here in blue, I've highlighted some areas where behavior-driven development can help optimize some of these steps. What we notice is that these things in blue all share the same specifications, right? When we figure something out and we plan it, we're essentially developing a specification. When we build something, we are using the specification as our blueprint. When we're testing something, we're simply executing those specs as if they were test cases, and we're checking to see does the actual delivered behavior meet what we said it should, right? And if we already have those specifications that we can use as test cases, maybe there's a way we can, we can, we can automate those specifications to run our tests for us. And then the documentation, well, if you've written your specs really well and in an easy, plain language, intuitive way, then you've taken care of the documentation for how to describe your behaviors. That's pretty cool. Right here, we've seen there, there might be some, some efficiencies we can gain all around this idea of good specification. So let's lean into this, this idea. Specification by example clearly defines behaviors for development, testing, and automation as shared artifacts. You may have heard of this idea of specification by example. Um, it actually predates some of the behavior-driven development stuff. Uh, spe spec by example, I think, as an idea first came out in like the mid-thousands or so. But this idea that, you know, if you can use plain language to clearly state what you want to build and provide concrete examples of it, then you're going to optimize your development process because you're going to make sure all the three amigos understand exactly what's going on and you're going to make it plain as day. And you're going to have it as an artifact that you can carry throughout your process as a form of transparency and accountability. So in behavior-driven development, uh, specification by example particularly comes into play with something called Gherkin scenarios or Gherkin feature files. And they dovetail right off of our previous activity of example mapping. Right? If you recall in example mapping, we wrote these green example cards. And I mentioned at the time, those are your starting points for your test cases. Because essentially, those example cards are like specification by example. They're providing concrete examples of how the behavior is supposed to be developed. And so what we can do as part of a refinement activity early in the sprint is we can take these example cards and we can formalize them into Gherkin feature files. We can enact specification upon the examples we have. And so the, the product of that will be the artifacts of these Gherkin feature files themselves. So what does Gherkin look, look like? You may have seen it, you may not have seen it. Um, here it is an example feature file for our shopping cart story. This is what I would consider a proper Gherkin. At the top of our feature file, we have a feature section. You can see that underlined in purple there. And we give it the name of our story. Underneath of that, the following lines are going to be treated as documentation. I personally like to put our user story there as a blank, I want a blank, so the blank. I like putting the user story there so it is, it is recorded as is a continuation of the artifact. And it makes it very clear when we reference this feature file in the future, after we've cleared our JIRA board and we know we can never find those JIRA tickets again, we still have a record of the value statement of the user story together with our specification. So it can kind of guide and kind of refresh us if we ever go back to it. Underneath the feature section, you can have one to many scenarios. Each scenario is its own section. So here I've added one scenario, adding items to the cart. Our scenarios are written with given when then steps. Given when then is the heart of the Gherkin language. Uh, it, is, it is another rephrasing of our age old testing pattern, arrange, act, assert. Given when then are just the BDD phrases of it. So what do these steps represent? Given an initial state, when an action is taken, then you verify the outcomes. Given, initial state, 
when action is taken, then verify outcomes. Again, it's just like a React assert. So I'll write my Birkin steps in plain language like this. Given the cart has five items, when eight items are added to the cart, then the cart contains 13 items. Concrete example, real numbers, not abstract, five plus eight is 13. Clear setup, clear main behavior, clear assertion to be made. Given, when, then. And when we write them at this level, even though it's a little bit more formalized, anybody can still understand it. All three amigos, biz dev test, can read this and understand it. So it, it helps to reinforce that collaboration aspect. It's just we're writing them a little bit more formally. Um, sometimes people ask me, Andy, when we're in our example mapping session, should we, should we be writing our example cards in Gherkin? And typically I'll say no. And that's because the example mapping activity should take a 20 to 30 minute time window. If you're taking more than 30 minutes, you should cut yourself off, take a few minutes retro on why it took so long and then try it again. Um, if you try to write your Gherkin inside of your example mapping activity, you're gonna find that it takes way too long <laughs> and you're gonna blow your time limit. So write your example cards, you know, kind of just straight up plain language. And then after the activity, refine those example cards into your uh, Gherkin scenarios. <laughs> so why use examples? Again, people understand real world examples better than abstractions. We're trying to eliminate confusion. We're trying to eliminate miscommunication. We're trying to establish an artifact that can hold our team accountable, as well as to uphold transparency in what we're trying to develop. Now, why use Gherkin as opposed to possibly other specification languages? Well, Gherkin, well, with Gherkin, we can automate these test case scenarios very easily, right? We know that the specification is a test case, Cool. All we need to do to, to automate that specification is add a little bit of formality around it. That's why we have these given when then steps. That's why you can see the things I've bolded and colored as keywords, right? Just, just a little bit of formality to the language can allow a, an automation framework to go in there and insert code in some very interesting ways. So, so why further? Um, I've heard people say to me, well, you know, this is all great in theory, but if I'm not like doing the pure BDD practice, then this, this idea of a Gherkin based BDD test framework for automation is just a waste of my time. I spend all this time writing all these Gherkin steps out and then people on my team aren't very good with English and they make it read really bad. And then I have to go do the automation anyway. And it just gets in the way. It's just this extra layer of crust that, that really slows me down. And if I could just be on my own, in my own little silo, not communicating with anybody else, you know, I could just automate these things like a whiz bang and boom, it's done. And I can read the code and that's all that matters, right? Oh, well, let me show you another little benefit for why you would use Gherkin to automate your tests and to write these scenarios. These Gherkin steps are reusable, right? One of the most common problems within test automation development is code duplication because testing is a very repetitive activity. I mean, think about it. If you test a web app, how many times do you need to log in? How many times do you need to navigate to whatever page? Or like even REST API, how many times do you need to get your authentication token? every single test. <laughs> that is a duplicate action. And so we need to have a way that we can easily repeat the testing steps without repeating the automation code. And so with Gherkin steps being reusable, right? If I already have steps to log into the app, to navigate to this page, to add this new record, to get my authorization token, if I already have these steps, I write them once, I use them anywhere, it's baller. And so if I have a, a good body of steps already written up, then you know, the, the first couple tests might be a little bit slow to get going to develop. But after that, you're gonna be able to develop new test cases rapidly. Um, I mean, I, I use a, a BDD automation solution at my nine to five uh, that we've built from the ground up over the past two years. And <coughs> pardon me, we use uh, C-sharp with Specflow. And I mean, 
there are times now where we have to write new test cases for new features. And we have enough steps already existing that the new test cases simply reuse the existing steps. All we need to do is just write some new Gherkin. We never have to write more C-sharp code and we have automated tests just from that. That's what we call the automation snowball. When you've built up this critical mass of reusability and then it just pays dividends. So um, it, that is very, very, um, or that's very much enabled by good Gherkin because at the test case level, not just the test code level, but at the test case level, I'm able to easily reuse entire steps. Very, very valuable reason why, uh, or for using uh, BDD frameworks. So I'm not going to talk specifically about BDD test automation in this talk. That would need its own webinar, course, all that good stuff. But what I will do is I will point you, point y'all to some popular BDD frameworks that are out there so that you can learn more. Um, most of these are Gherkin based, though there is no quote unquote um, official standard for the Gherkin language. The de facto standard comes from the Cucumber project. But um, anywho, so if you're going to be doing, if you're interested in doing this with C Sharp, I highly recommend the Specflow framework. That's Cucumber for .NET. There's also a framework called Concordian out there, which adds a few nifty features. In Java, uh, the classic is Cucumber JVM. That comes from the Cucumber project itself. But some others include JBHave, which actually I think predated Cucumber a little bit. There's also the Serenity project, which is like BDD on steroids with a uh, screenplay pattern. Don't tell John Ferguson Smart I said that, because that's a very, very bad interpretation. Serenity is awesome, don't get me wrong. They have a lot, a lot of really cool stuff in there. Um, it's it's um, a bit more powerful than just raw cucumber, as well as Concordian has a Java implementation. If you're looking in JavaScript, Cucumber has a version for that. Uh, there's also some other side projects that are a little interesting called Vals and Yado. Um, side note, uh, Jasmine claims itself to be behavior driven. I don't claim that one to be classically behavior driven, though in concept, I guess it is. PHP, the classic one's BHAT, but there's also code exception. Ruby is the classic implementation of Cucumber. Then there's also another one called spinach because apparently people love the vegetables. Now Python, I love Python as y'all know. Uh, I right now recommend PyTest BDD as the best um, BDD framework in Python, though it does have some rough edges. Um, others classically include Behave. That's historically been, I think, the most popular just from talking with people in the community. Uh, there's also one called Radish that adds a few extra elements to the Gherkin language, so it's pretty cool. So yeah, if you're interested in doing BDD automation, definitely check some of these out. So I have chewed y'all's ears off and we're coming up on nine o'clock here. So let's tie all these things together. As you recall at the beginning, I said, I hated buzzwords, I hated false definitions, um, but I love BDD. And so if I were to define BDD, now that we've seen some of the problems that teams face, as well as solutions that behavior-driven practices can address, I'd like to define BDD as this, where it's practical problem solving with a behavior-oriented focus. So if we look at the problems we we're trying to solve, when we had a problem with communication, our solution was to do three amigos collaboration. When we had problems with poor planning, we had a solution in example mapping. And when we had a problem with deadlines, we saw how we could optimize our process with specification and automation. So that is what I consider true BDD, behavior-driven development. BDD is a set of pragmatic practices that puts software behaviors first. Why would we do that? Because ultimately, your users do. Users don't care how fancy your implementation is. They care that they get value out of the behaviors they're able to enact with the software product you deliver them. So BDD has tons of benefits, right? We, we've seen how it improves collaboration. We've seen how it empowers automation. We've seen how it can make your entire development process much more efficient. We've seen how we can trace, we can trace inspiration to automation because we have these artifacts of our specifications. And we've also seen how it can help hold a team accountable 
There's no he said, she said. When we develop our specs, when we write our, our uh, example mapping cards, when we have our Gherkin scenarios, we essentially have our proof of purchase. This is what we said we would do. Now let's actually go and do it. Now, there are also tons of misconceptions with BDD. Um, as I said before, it seems to have a, a love it or hate it kind of stance within our um, industry. And so I'd like to dispel some of the things that BDD is not. So BDD is not just an automation tool. I made it very clear from the start that BDD is really much more of a process than just a, a tool or a, a way of doing something, right? It's, it is this process, it's a set of helpful practices, right? It's not limited to just the tester role on your team. It's not limited to just this weird type of given when then test framework, right? It's also not just a testing or QA practice, right? This is something that everyone, whether they are developer, tester, or business person, need to participate in, right? All these kinds of things are things that need to be done as part of software development. I didn't invent these problems, <laughs> right? They're there. If you've been on a software development team, you have felt this pain, um, right? <coughs> Pardon me. It, it's not like the, we expect the tester alone to champion these BDD practices and then fix all the problems. Right? It, this is something that we, we all share. Right? And BDD is simply providing healthy, helpful practices to solve these problems in a better way. It's not an overhaul to your process. Um, BDD also is not good for unit testing. Oh my gosh. A lot of times I provide examples in code just to, to show how a, a BDD framework works using a unit-like test. But really where, where BDD is gonna shine is at the feature level. When you're making features for customers or when you're making black box features, like maybe a REST API or something, right? It really, really shines for feature level testing, not unit testing. Uh, BDD frameworks are also not lousy framework choices for automation. Now people say that, oh, all this, this Gherkin stuff gets in my way and I hate it, I just wanna throw it away. Remember, right, as a developer alone or as a tester alone, the Gherkin is not exclusively for you and your pleasure. <laughs> the Gherkin is for the team. The Gherkin is for documentation, right? I mean, here, here's something that we've done with our, our test suite that's we have um, using Specflow and Gherkin scenarios. Whenever a test fails in our continuous integration pipeline and we look at the results and we assert that, yes, this is a true failure, not some sort of infrastructure issue or performance fluke. When I go to open the bug ticket, I copy and paste the, the scenario because it perfectly describes the rep how to reproduce that particular bug. Oh, given you're at this starting point, when you do this, oh shoot, this doesn't happen, but that's what should happen. Easy bug report, right? So you get all sorts of these advantages out of the BDD framework, right? You get, like I said, the automation snowball with reusability of steps. So the BDD frameworks, even if you aren't doing other collaborative BDD processes, I will strongly assert is still a very, very good type of automation framework. Uh, BDD is also not a replacement for Agile or other processes, rather it's a complement. And as such, BDD is not difficult to start, right? How hard would it be to try to do some example mapping? How hard would it be to try to maybe specify your, your tests as given when then scenarios, right? You can, you can lean into it, you can ramp up to it, um, but don't feel like there's this huge learning curve that, that will inhibit you from getting started. Because these practices, like I said, are meant to be pragmatic. They're meant to be helpful. They're meant to solve problems that we all feel. So that is what I have to say about that. So thank you very much for listening to me talk about something I'm very, very passionate about. If you want to learn more, you can check out my blog. I have a whole page on BDD. You can also follow me on Twitter at automationpanda.com. Uh, you can also check out things like Test Automation University that have lots of material, not just developed by me, but also by people like Carlos and other leading experts in our field, where you can learn how to do new things with testing and automation for free online. Whew. So with that said, we can open it up to question and answer. 
All right. First off, uh, Andy, thank you so much. That was a very, very insightful, very, very helpful presentation. Um, I, I'll admit that uh, I, I've talked to my team about example mapping, but I could not have explained it the way that you did. It was very, very clear, very concise, and whew, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna like send this video to my team. Like, <laughs> just just watch this. Like, th this is better. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. So seriously, that was awesome. Uh, I'll, I'll start asking some questions, but. Um, once I'm done with this list, it's open to anyone else who wants to chime in. So feel free to take yourself off mute uh, and ask. Uh, I'll go through the first few questions and then I'll open it up to everyone else. Uh, so the very, very first thing that we want to make sure we get to is, uh, I think hopefully you, you really drilled the point into the value behind it, uh, what it actually is, uh, demystifying some of these uh, myths as well or misconceptions around it. But now that we have this, how can I tomorrow start implementing something like the three amigos ah great question so the the easiest way to get started would be a sort of grassroots effort regardless of whatever role you're in whether that's biz dev or test um there will be times maybe not necessarily tomorrow but in the coming week or weeks where you will need to collaborate on something and it may be tempting for you just to grab one other person like oh let me just get the product owner really quick while i have them explain this behavior to me so I can write the test for it. In that moment, I would say, hey, don't just grab one other role, grab both of the other roles and bring them together to chat for maybe 20, 30 minutes about it. That is your ad hoc three amigos. That's probably the, the quickest and easiest way to get started. Um, I found that like, if you try to you know, institute some sort of new mega process on your team, and you know, force rules down somebody's throat and all that kind of stuff, it's probably not gonna go well. The better way is to demonstrate meaningful value out of these practices and let them speak for themselves. And then what you'll find is light bulbs will go off and champions will rise up on their own. And at that point, you can start to you know, push a little bit more on these kinds of things. So you know, you've had a you know, your ad hoc three amigo sessions and people are saying, oh, wow, this is really valuable. Then maybe in one of your team retros, you can say, hey, such and such and such and I have been getting together um, to talk about certain things from time to time. And we found it to be very valuable because of X, Y, and Z reasons. Maybe this, th this is something that, that um, people in the industry call three amigos. Maybe we should do this a little bit more often, right? Oh, and then, okay, no. So now the whole team is recognizing that, that the three amigos is a thing and it's good. I mean, who can, who can argue with that, right? Or like when it comes to example mapping, um, I'll give an example of what happened in my, my company one time. Uh, there was a developer on our team who was given a story that was very poorly refined, didn't really have a clear user story, didn't really have any acceptance criteria. And so he was like, you know, I, I'm, I've been assigned this work and I don't really know what I should be doing with this because it's kind of fuzzy. But I heard Andy talk about this example mapping activity and I'd like to try that. So he came to me and he said, Andy, can, can we do this example mapping thing we've talked about? Because I want to give it a try, but I don't feel confident about it. And I know you're good about it. So maybe you could be like, maybe you could be the testing role in this and then we can get one of the, the, the um, projects Matt, or <coughs> product managers in on this too. And so we did, and it worked out really well. And then the next time we did it, I was not necessarily the testing role. There was another tester there. I was simply a facilitator. And then after that, when he did this again, I didn't even need to be there. And he's the one who's doing this. And then later, other people in the team start doing this on their own. And so now there has been serious talk on my team of saying, wow, example mapping really works. This helps us plan cool. And so you can start to do these kinds of things like that. Yeah, I like that. I like how it, it I feel like a lot of these kind of things are driven by the tester. Mm. Uh, we, we just had someone post a question of like, is this something that a classic tester should do? And what they meant by that is like a, a human centric tester. Is this something that they should be doing? Um, or is there something else that they should be doing? I mean, no reason why not. Right, uh, whether th a tester is a, a traditional manual tester, human-oriented user experience tester, or they're much more into automation, 
um, I mean, they, they still need to know what the specifications are, right? They still need to have a, a clear grasp on the behavior. And their insights at the time of planning and design are very valuable because they may see things that a, a product owner or a developer don't see. So absolutely, yes, this is for them too. Uh, next question we have is, when should you not use a BDD tool like Cucumber? You should not use a BDD tool like Cucumber if you're trying to automate unit tests. <laughs> Otherwise, use it? Um, not necessarily. I mean, you, you should determine what is best for your team. Um, personally, I probably wouldn't use something like Cucumber for raw REST API testing, right? And what I mean by that is if, if you're doing basic REST API tests where it's kind of like either contract level or form a request, make the method, parse the response, that kind of stuff, I would probably not use a, a pure BDD framework for. I'd probably just use something like PyTest because it's, you know, REST APIs are, excuse me, very, very um, programmatic. Or if you have to do direct database testing, that would be another case because even though it's it's not like a white box test per se, it's still very programmatic. And so BDD as a test framework is not good for those very programmatic cases. BDD is very good for those, those descriptive cases, the, the true feature testing. Like, hey, I need to develop this new type of thing on my web page, or hey, I need to come up with this new user flow. That's when it's going to be very, very powerful because at the heart of it, you, you are, you are thinking before you code in, in terms of your tests, right? If we're talking about automation, I mean, hell, you're thinking before you code when you're talking about development too. But like in terms of like testing and automation, right? It's, it's very, very easy to fall into this pattern of, oh shoot, I got to automate these tests. Let me just drop right into PyTest or something, just crank some Python code out, right? When what we really ought to do is we need to recognize the separation of concerns between the test case and the test code. The test case is simply a procedure that exercises behavior and makes verifications, right? The test case is this, this, this um, metaphysical type of entity. It's a thing that is, right? And how we identify that test case is we apply plain language words to describe it. And if you can't describe a behavior of a feature in plain language, then that's a big yellow flag to indicate that maybe it doesn't have a good design. <laughs> maybe you need to go back to the drawing board with it. And so then once you have your test case identified, then the automation of it is, is a separate concern and a, a consequential concern. And if you have a BDD style framework, it's, it's, it's just the, nat the next natural step. Yeah, you actually answered a, a few questions in that, in that answer. So well done, you oh, like wow. knocked off two of them. But <laughs> um, another question that we had was, uh, if your features and scenarios are being version controlled, because you're using something like a spec flow. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't this be duplicate because you're also writing these things and tickets being tracked in a tool like Jira? Uh, yes and no. Um, I would assert that when you do this type of, um, this type of, uh, I can call it process. When you do this type of process with this type of test automation, um, Ultimately, there needs to be what becomes a single source of truth for your artifacts and specifically with the automation for your feature files and your automation code, right? So the way I typically see this is that um, tools like Jira or version one or whatever um, historically have been terrible repositories for information. They're very, very good at you put something in and then you plan it for a particular cycle or iteration or sprint or release or whatever you want to call the dang thing. And then you move the, the tickets along through whatever board, you know, status tracking. And then when you hit the release button, it's gone. And in theory, you can query it back. But in actuality, it's a huge pain. And the interfaces are not designed in such a way that they present you with searchable specifications like these feature files. So while yes, you may put your, as a blank, I want a blank, so the blank user story in a Jira ticket. And yes, you may put your, um, your example mapping cards attached to a Jira ticket. And yes, you should do that, by the way. I'm not saying don't do that. Um, but ultimately, the, the permanent artifact is not necessarily going to be those example cards. 
but what comes out of those example cards. The example, the, the, the um, example mapping cards are going to exist primarily for that iteration, and then they're less important artifacts, so to speak, but the important artifacts to remain will be your feature files, will be your Gherkin, and will be your uh, automation code. And so at that point, the single source of truth for what your feature files are should be the one that's in the version control with your automation. So even if you had put something in a JIRA ticket as far as the, as far as the planning, storming, forming, refining, collaboration, whatever, cool, good, awesome, let it burn. Version control is the place to put it. Oh, oh, I'm sure they'll get some questions, uh, some more of that. But uh, sure. I do like, I, I do think that um, people using version controlled tools like GitHub or GitLab is kind of underrated. At Workfront, we just barely started putting our technical design documents uh, in GitLab uh, oh, wow. because it was much easier for us to, I, I mean, because like, it's just a document that mm -hmm. we're all working on. You see the, the iterations of it. You see who's, mm -hmm. who's touching it, who's changing it. There's history. Uh, yeah. and, and to your point, uh, you now have, you have that, queryable history uh, yes. and you can actually look through things, how, they, how we got to where we got, why, um, and you can just hold all your assets in there as well. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Version control for the win, man. So funny, funny story about that. When I was in college, I did a creative writing minor because I had to concentrate in some liberal arts thing for my program. And I'm like, yeah, two more classes, you get a minor. And so I had to take a poetry class and I was very, very particular about the poetry I was writing. And like, I would, I would go back and like edit things because poetry has to be very careful. So I said, you know what? Screw this. I'm a computer science student. I put my poems in version control. <laughs> <laughs> True story. You're like, where, where's your poet? Like, where's your poetry? Oh, it's in GitHub. <laughs> Just clone. <laughs> Basically, I think at that time I was using Subversion, but yeah, it was, it was pretty. I mean, it made sense, right? Because it does, we, we seem to have this narrow-minded concept that version control is only for some sort of code. But it's like, it's, it's a history tracker for any sort of textual-based document. So yeah, you can put design docs in there. You could put, you know, feature files without any BDD automation code in there. Totally cool. Next question. Are there any drawbacks in using BDD? I don't know if they mean the actual, like, behavior-driven development or if they meant, like, the a tool, but the question is they're all the same. Are there any drawbacks in using BDD? So I'll answer both. First I'll answer process, then I'll answer tools and frameworks. So drawbacks of using behavior driven development, um, like as a process, really, I can't think of any off the top of my head because like I said before, right? These are all problems that are very, very common to all software development teams and from my experience, they're all problems that have yet to have like really robust, consistent solutions across multiple teams. And so behavior-driven development is not meant to be this, this new replacement for agile or something. It's meant to be a pragmatic set of practices to help you solve the problems you have. And so what I would also say to that is, if you're on a very, very successful team that isn't having these kinds of problems for some, like, you know, if, if you already have a very, very good process and a very, very good practice where your folks are collaborating and you are doing very, very well with planning, maybe you have your own planning activity that's not example mapping and not a whatever else, right? That's cool. And maybe you are able to get all the stuff done in a sprint and um, you, you have a, a solid test automation solution in place that's not BDD, right? If, if that is working for you, more power to you. Like, I want to know more about that kind of success because we can learn from that as well. What are you doing that might be a little bit different? Or are we doing similar things just by different names? Who knows, right? Um, the, my, my goal in preaching about BDD like this is not to become some sort of tyrannical dictator to say, you must do things this way, right? Kind of like how the agile coaches were back in the <laughs> thousands saying, you must practice scrum. You must have two week iterations. You must have a separate scrum master. You must apply points like this or else it's all going to be bad and broke, right? It's not like that. I'm not saying like you have to, you know, dot every I and cross every T. Instead, what I'm saying is, look, here's some problems we all know about. Here are ways that I have found and other teams have found to really help solve these problems in a clever and efficient way. And if you think this could help you as well, give it a try. There's nothing stopping you. You know, you're not going to hurt my opinions unless you 
for some reason trash what I'm saying <laughs> for poor reasons, you know? Like, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't see any drawbacks to using the, the processes of BDD as I've described them, right? I mean, I guess you, if you wanna do example mapping activities, it may take a little bit more time for planning and refinement to do that more than your team is accustomed to, right? But I would retort to say, you're front loading your time. It's either you're going to handle concerns initially upfront and gain efficiencies, or you're going to suffer with the inefficient consequences later. And so many people are accustomed to handling inefficient consequences later that it's become the normal. And so to try to change that process, and change is difficult anytime, people get stubborn, you know? So, um, but yeah, like if, if you, if you think there is something good to gain out of these practices, give it a try. And don't feel bad if it doesn't work out the first time or two, because, you know, it's not that there's no learning curve. There's a bit of a learning curve. Um, and just, you know, keep at it. And if, if you see the value there, then the value will get delivered. So now I think the second part of that question is, are there any drawbacks to BDD tools and specifically like the test automation frameworks? Uh, yeah, there can be, right? Um, if your team is not doing um, the, is not doing other BDD practices, or if you and your team do not have any um, intention of doing those kinds of activities, then it may take a little bit more work for you to set up a BDD style framework as opposed to a more traditional framework, right? It may take a bit more time and discipline to learn how to write good gherkin, how to form steps in a way that they will enable an automation snowball. And I think that's where a lot of people hit frustration and they give up and they say, this whole BDD gherkin thing sucks, it's just in my way, is because it is opinionated and it does take a little bit more effort to get it working. But once you do get it working, it's, it's phenomenal. <laughs> And I, I'll, I'll be honest, that's where I was at. Um, and you know, because you, you were on stream with me, helping me out mm -hmm. with uh, Pylenium and stuff. Um, I told you the stories of where I started with it and I just had to do it until I finally figured out what I was doing wrong. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh, hey, that's, that's actually really cool. You know? Yeah. yeah, so I totally agree. It's kind of just, you have to get past that little hump mm -hmm. if you're used to the traditional style. Mm -hmm. uh, but once you're done with that, it, it is actually really cool. And that automation snowball is a legit thing. Uh, and it's, it's cool that you're writing tasks with like English sentences. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, the last question I have, uh, before we turn it over to everybody else, uh, is, uh, we were talking a lot about like in sprint kind of stuff, right? Like the, the whole three amigos and the shifting left kind of a thing. Um, but how would you implement BDD on things that already exist? So you're, you're, mm. you're kind of doing it reactively at this point. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I mean, uh, that's kind of what I had to do at my current company, because they had just been developing and developing and developing for years in banking software. And there ain't nothing wrong with that. They were very successful. They made a very good product. They made a very lot of money. Very lot. Well, my English is not good. They made lots of money. <laughs> um, but yeah, they, they hadn't done any sort of BDD practice, let alone they hadn't even done a uh, feature level test, um, test automation. So like the whole reason I was hired was because they got to a size where they're like, oh crap, this is a, this is a gap we have. We need, to, we need to plug this hole. And so um, I can just kind of describe what I've done in that kind of situation where I came into a shop that was not already doing BDD practices or even any test automation and how I've helped facilitate that to happen. Um, when, I, when I first started my <clears throat> my main role was like, Andy, we got to get some, some testing and quality practices in place because this, this ain't good. We don't have any. I'm like, okay, cool. They already had a strong battery of unit tests. That was my first thing. Where are your unit tests? Do you have unit tests? They had unit tests. Um, good, bad, ugly, whatever. They had them. They were good. They were valuable. They were catching things when they needed to. So I immediately then moved to the feature level, which because it's a web application, we focused on web UI and REST API kinds of testing. And I knew from the start that I wanted to pursue a, or I wanted to build a, um, a BDD test automation solution because I knew the benefits it could bring. And since 
that was going to start from the ground up, right? The fact that there was no test automation there, I could essentially build it the, build it the way I wanted, which is really nice. And so I, we, we chose to use C Sharp as our language because my company is the Microsoft Azure.NET shop, everything. Um, yeah, they, it was pretty hard for me because the other candidate language is Python. And I chose to do .NET C Sharp instead of Python. And it was my choice, but it was the right choice for the company. Um, though some days I look back on that, I'm like, man. Anyway, that's, that's coffee talk. Um, we, we got C Sharp, we use Selenium obviously for um, web UI browser automation, REST Sharp for REST, U, REST, REST UI, REST APIs, and then SpecFlow as our core framework. So we could have those, those Gherkin steps. And um, yeah, I mean, it didn't take long for us to hit the automation snowball. I, I originally started using a page object pattern for modeling web interactions and quickly implemented our own uh, screenplay pattern after that, because I'm like, oh, this ain't gonna scale. And um, so yeah, uh, we, we wrote all of our tests using SpecFlow, uh, good Gherkin practices. And for, I'd say like about a year, you know, I was pretty much the only person doing much of any automation work. We had some developers come in, start learning, start automating new tests with new features over time. That was really cool too. Um, and then it was in my second year that since we had this BDD test automation framework, I should say we had a behavior oriented automation architecture. Not just that well, we had a framework in place, whoop de do. We had a robust test automation solution, right? We had layers to our solution where we separate things like test case from test code. We had um, solid design patterns like the screenplay pattern. We had um, very good practices with our, our Gherkin writing so that tests would be concise but meaningful uh, and then we would get that automation snowball. And because I was able to demonstrate great success with our test automation solution and that it would, it would run continuously, um, it would run nightly, it was finding legitimate bugs that developers had not caught prior to them deploying to uh, in internal environments. Um, it was giving good test reports. It was giving fast feedback. Um, they, it, it was a no brainer to say, oh, wow. Like I, I was copying Gherkin scenarios into to bug reports. It was like, oh, wow, this is actually really beneficial. And that was done entirely without any mention of behavior driven development practices in the company at that point. Nobody was doing example mapping. Nobody really knew what the three amigos were. Nobody was thinking about better collaboration and better automation through process efficiency, right? But what I was able to do because we had demonstrated such success is I was able to start pushing ideas left to be like, hey, you know, these Gherkin scenarios are really cool. And when I'm going out and training these developers on how to do it, I'm saying like, hey, they're saying like, oh, wow, light bulb's going off. Like, you know, this is, I wish that when we were doing our sprint planning and our, our, our ticket grooming, that we would, we would be thinking about what these scenarios should be, right? <laughs> or like I mentioned with, with um, the, the teammate of mine who, who became our example mapping champion, you know, I kind of showed them what example mapping was, but this guy, he, he called the fire, man. He, he saw the value and I didn't have to preach it anymore. I, I just showed how to facilitate it and he's preaching it. Right. And so now as a result of that, it is, it is our team's practice that, Hey, if you need to refine a story, do an example mapping activity. And that will, that feeds directly into our test automation solution. Right. So, you know, that's kind of how we, we facilitated that. Dang. Awesome, man. Shoot. Uh, for now, like for the rest of the time, I'm going to open the floor up to anybody else who would like to ask questions. Uh, like I said, please come off mute. Uh, and ask Candy kind of whatever you have. Okay, so this is the continuation of the previous question regarding the starting the BDD late. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so after you started with the BDD, mm -hmm. uh, did you implement the whole Tres Amigas process after all, or it's still like more just writing automation in Gherkin and stuff like that. So did you start the, the process that you described in the beginning? 
as the like normal practice in the within the company? So I would say that in my company right now, we are still in a phase of evolution with this. So people recognize the three amigos are good. People recognize that when they, they start planning things and they start um, designing things that yes, they should have a representative of each of the three amigos. Sometimes people call them three amigos meetings when they have them, sometimes they don't. Um, sometimes people do um, example mapping on their own. Sometimes example mapping doesn't happen. So um, I would not say that we are like a full on BDD purist like shop. I would not say that um, that we will ever get there per se. I'm, and I'm not saying that we need to ever get there, right? What we're, what we're showing is with the practices as we're iterating through them is that they're delivering increasingly more value the more that we do these kinds of things. And so um, <clears throat> like, yeah, we, we don't have like once a week, three amigos meetings scheduled on our calendar, right? That's, that's not what we're doing right now. We don't have um, a requirement that every single story must undergo example mapping. We don't have that. Should we have that? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Let's evolve and see what happens when we get there. All right, thanks. Maybe another thing I, I wanted to ask, do you think that um, pretty much test-driven development and BDD can be a good match to work together. Certainly, certainly. certainly. Um, if you pair test-driven development up with behavior-driven development, what you will find is that test-driven development typically focuses more on the unit testing aspect and the, the actual code development, where you know a developer will get these, these specifications and then they will write unit tests to um, kind of lay out exactly what the code that they're developing should do, and then they'll develop the code, and then they'll run the unit test and make sure that they're passing and then refactor. Whereas the, the BDD side of it is more feature level, right? Um, test driven development is more code level, or behavior driven development is more feature level, where it, it's kind of like the same thing of, okay, you specify your behaviors, those become test cases, you develop and test against what those specifications are and make sure it's good. So they, they are very much complementary, excuse me, complementary practices. Thanks. Um, I had one question. Um, when you do these uh, three amigos kind of meetings, do you generally find that those happen in your weekly grooming or refinement me meetings, or are these more of a ad hoc thing, or is it just dependent on your situation? I would say all the above. So we, like, if if you have a a typical capital A agile scrum process on two week sprints with ceremonies, then the grooming meetings truly ought to be, or refinement, grooming, whatever you want to call them. Those meetings should inherently be three amigos meetings because you should have biz dev tests there, right? Your planning meetings should be three amigos meetings by default because you have biz dev tests there, right? Um, in my company, we don't follow capital A, agile, capital S scrum, <laughs> uh, though we're starting to formalize a little bit more in that. Um, I prefer to take a more post agile approach. I'm, I'm cynical about scrum. But um, I won't get into that right now. Uh, but like we we do have it where in our in our, our planning meetings that right it's mostly developers, but we also have testers there, and hopefully we also have our, our product owners. Um, we do have it where there are ad hoc three amigos meetings, and typically the ad hoc three amigos meetings have the purpose of either a doing example mapping or b doing a question storming, <laughs> where hey, we don't really understand anything about this thing. We need to ask just a bunch of questions to get answers. So that's kind of how we run it. Awesome, thanks. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? We got, I'll give you like 60 more seconds before we whoosh, wrap it up. So ask a question if you got something. I'll, I'll do one more. Um, if you were gonna try and implement this at a new place, would you start with more of the behavior as in the three amigos and the 
uh, mapping or would you kind of go how you did it where you start with the BDD framework first? That depends on what my role is and what the company's needs are. So like at my current company, the developers were all very, very strong. Um, they assented to the value and need of quality. Uh, they, they already had fairly good communication in and of themselves. The, the major piece they were missing was the test automation. They didn't have that, that safety net. They didn't have continuous testing. They didn't have any feedback basically at a feature level. And so that's why I zeroed in on the, the uh, test automation framework. And I mean, because I am who I am and I believe what I believe, I'm like, I'm using a BDD as, or I'm using a BDD framework as my core framework in my test automation solution, right? If I were to join another team or another company and they were to have different problems, like if, if they were to be, I don't know, totally dysfunctional in how they're uh, collaborating across roles, right? Or if they were um, constantly, constantly uh, playing a game of telephone where uh, like the product owner says one thing, developer builds another thing, tester has another interpretation. At the end of the sprint, they go back and demo and product owner says, this is garbage, you're all wrong, <laughs> right? In those cases, I would probably try to lean more into, um, hey, let's, let's try to get this collaboration piece down before we even bother automating tests because otherwise we're just automating pointless procedures <laughs> that have no value, right? Um, and I guess an, another aspect of that is also what would my role on that team or in that company be? Would I have the agency to be able to and to affect change in those ways, right? You know, at, at my current company, I'm very, very grateful because they, they basically handed me the keys to the kingdom. They said, Andy, this is your thing. Um, you know, testing, automation, quality, this kind of stuff, go make it happen. And so I, I came up with a strategy. I came up with a plan. I reviewed it with people, had a few tweaks here and there with some good feedback. And I was basically trusted to do what I saw fit, right? If I were to end up in another company and they were to see me as little more than just some automation ear, am I going to have the platform from day one to be able to speak truth to a bunch of other roles to say, hey, why don't we try to do something this way, right? So there's, there's that, that tension as well, which can be very, very difficult to navigate because at the same time, I wouldn't want some new guy coming into my team and saying, no, 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 you're doing everything horribly wrong. Do it completely different because I'm right and arrogant and egotistical, <laughs> right? You don't want that. <laughs> so it's, it's a tough situation in a case-by-case -case basis. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, Andy, thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, everyone, thanks for, for um, attending and for asking your questions. Uh, I hope it was helpful. Uh, for me, it definitely was. Uh, I'm, I took a few screenshots and uh, I'll be posting this video later. Um, check for it in the QA at the Point channel um, in the QA Utah Slack group. But otherwise, Andy, thank you so much again. That was an amazing presentation. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And feel free to reach out to me at any time.